Well, I'm glad to see everybody enjoying the exhibits. Hope you enjoy the uh, appetizers, or what do you call it? Antipasto, health food stuff. Everything is healthy. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Howard Wolin. Dr. Wolin has been practicing uh, for 39 years, and I think I know him that long. I have to say it has helped my family immeasurably over the years. Uh, and uh, I've seen his evolution from a psychoanalyst uh, to a uh, holistic physician, using all sorts of uh, methods that are just uh, miraculous, in my, my opinion. But it's a pleasure to introduce to you my family physician, my personal physician, your friend, Dr. Howard Wood. Thank, thank you and Mary Lou for the honor of being here today. Um, my name indeed is Howard Wood, and um, on my journey of life, I have had an awakening, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, that has enabled me to heal my patients treat them mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. The physical part of that journey started obviously 68 years ago, but for the last 50 years, the journey has taken me to college, to medical school, to internship, to psychiatric residency, to chief resident in psychiatry, to psychiatric practice, psych psychiatric practice along with geriatric psychiatry, psychoanalytic training, psychoanalytic practice, holistic training, holistic practice, and to the honor, about a year ago, I have worked for the last five years with a Native American whose name is Pamela, who is now the junior chief of a healing tribe. The chief, the senior chief, is the grandfather of Pamela's, who is now 98 years old. There are four reservations in the United States. And I was honored last year by grandfather and Pamela by being designated medicine man. Um, my talk today is about how to become steel in order to deal with all the stresses of the current economic tsunami. And what I'm going to talk about are the following. The reality of what our senses have been reporting over the last three decades about um, what our reality is, the literal reality of where we are right now, the effects of that reality, the history of how we got to these effects, the causes of these effects, what you and us can do about it in terms of helping ourselves with, this, with these effects, and what I have been able to do to help my patients with these effects. There's a quote from a book called Dune. How many of you have read the book Dune? And it comes from the God Emperor of Dune, and the quote goes like this. Our minds construct this thing called reality. Reality is often totally independent of what our senses report. So over the last several decades, these are some of the things that our senses have reported have reported. If you work really hard, if you work diligently, if you work competently, if you work competitively, you could see, succeed. At the least, you could survive. You could, could, if you really worked hard, get ahead. You could prosper. You could get, garner security for yourself and your families. Your house, uh, whether you live on the North Shore or wherever, except for certain places, would appreciate in value. And though there would be bumps in whatever you invested in, um, and you would have downturns, recessions, etc., your investments would appreciate. And they would grow so that you could retire at age 65. And in addition, though all of us over 30 or 40 or 50 years have known clearly that politicians are self-serving at times, not to be trusted, at the least, they wouldn't totally betray you and not protect you from banks that, are, that would be failing, 
from a Wall Street that would be so corrupt that it would be beyond belief, or not beyond belief, and major corporations that would not fall apart. That's what our senses have reported. In, the, in, in reality, the reality in the last six months, and I see it in my patients, I see it in friends, I see it in colleagues, I see it in people who come up to me on the street, people who come up to me at six in the morning when I'm running in Romet, in, in a very quiet place, and I'll tell you that story in a little bit. The reality is very independent of what our senses have reported. And that is that if you work hard and diligently, a lot of people are saying that it doesn't matter, they're not going to easily survive, they're not going to get ahead, they're not going to prosper, and they're worried, they're terribly worried about what's going to happen to the security of their kids and grandkids. Their houses are not appreciating, in fact they're dropping in value. Um, their 401ks are turning into 201ks and 101ks. And I'll give you an example of this next piece. A dear friend of mine who works in the healing arts, works very, very hard, works very, very competently. And now, at this point, at the age of 52, with two kids because she married late, said to me the other day when we met and talked, that she knew she was going to work a long time, but now she doesn't even know if she's going to retire at age 80. And this is replete around everyone that I talk to. A lot of people are my age, and I'm 1,300 years, though I look 2,000, and even people older than me and younger than me don't see how easily they're going to retire. Um, the other piece is that it's fairly clear to all of you, and I don't want to repeat this, that banks are not easily staying together, that Wall Street isn't to be trusted, and that the politicians, though they're excoriating the banks and the corporations, themselves cannot be trusted, and there's been a betrayal there. So what has happened is that the reality is quite independent of what our senses have hoped or reported over years. And what are the effects of this? And this comes from every patient, every colleague. Yesterday I was running about 6 in the morning in Womet, and a guy who I know who drives the overrides truck came out and said, did you hear him talk yesterday? And this is not me revealing where I am politically about anyone. He said, we're all screwed. I mean, the guy was a total stranger, primarily, and everyone I talk to is very, very worried and very, very disappointed. And everyone is experiencing fear of lost security, uh, fear of lost wealth, lost livelihood, fear that they won't retire, fear that their houses will lose value. There's a lot of anger, there's a feeling of betrayal, there's insecurity, there's anxiety, there's worry. Worry for themselves, worry for their kids. There are betrayed hopes for future dreams. And there's an enormous amount of stress. There's a crankiness, a crabbiness. There's anxiety, there's depression, there's panic, there's chronic fatigue. One of my friends who's in the healing arts said that in the last six months she's seen more cancers than she's seen in several years. Um, there's insomnia, there's rage. And this is now the escalation of what I've seen over 40 or 50 years of life and 40 years of practice. So what are the history of this, these effects? If we go back to proto-man somewhere around 100,000 years ago, the caveman would have to get out of the cave and go and kill a wild boar for food and in the process either fight or run from a saber-toothed tiger. Now, the, the curse about this was that he could either get killed or run like hell. The blessing was that this happened very infrequently because that boar would last about two months before he had to go out and do it again. The virtue of that is that the fight-flight response in his adrenals could occur only intermittently. So now we fast forward to the time that I was little, which was 1941, 2, 3, and 4, in New York City, growing up in an endless childhood, with the capacity to go out and play and not have to be worried that there wasn't such a thing as childhood, to play stickball in the, in the schoolyard, to wind up playing baseball, staying out at night and not having to worry, and not being consumed by all of the technology. Then we fast forward to 1970 and my starting practice. I started on Michigan Avenue. There were two-story buildings on Michigan Avenue. There were no such things as cell phones. So when I was done using my landline and doing my psychotherapy, I could drive home on Sheridan Road at peace without having to be driven crazy by the phone. 
Um, and, and then if you, if you start in 1970, everyone that I saw except for three people were married. They had solid families. There were no divorces. If, if I fast forward over the 40 years of practice starting in the 80s, most people were divorced. Most people really, although they were divorced, were married for the rest of their lives, particularly if they had kids and had to deal with each other about them. Um, and the quiet that I described in the car, which included outside of the car, rest, relaxation, dinners at five o'clock with the whole family. How many of you have dinners with your whole family at the moment? One, two, three. God bless America. I've been practicing God bless America a lot because if I do it well, in four years, if I get that down and the wave as I go from the helicopter to the White House, I think Bob says that he'll, he'll sponsor me for running for president. I tell him, don't do it. Um, okay, so where was I? Dinners at five, a state of no programmed chaos, real relaxation. And now, if, if I take you forward from 1970 to the present, there was a growing amount of a programmed chaos in people, programmed chaos in their lives, programmed chaos in their children's lives. Uh, my dear friend and accountant has four kids. Two of them are in cheerleading. Two of them play hockey. There isn't a day of the week one day of the year that he isn't running someplace to schlep them someplace to do something. He loves it, he loves how they perform, he loves what they do, he loves to shout at the matches, but he walks around fried and totally exhausted all of the time. And this happens, this program chaos is going on all over the place. Um, I talked earlier about what I call the timelessness of childhood that has evaporated. And that reality has evaporated. About 1990, a child came to me with ADD for an evaluation. And the child came into the office and was in a tearful rage with his mother. And the rage was a function of the fact that she had an appointment with me, and I would have changed it had I known, and it interrupted a play date. Now, kids today, for obviously obvious reasons, need to have play dates because it's not a safe world, as you can see sometimes when you watch TV. And that state of affairs has changed dramatically over the 40 years of my practice. Uh, I talked to you about the program Chaos, I talked to you about the marriages, and I talked also about the fact that in the last 40 years, there's been an explosion in technology. In my opinion, I think it's enhanced everyone's capacity to work, the computer, the iPhone, all of that stuff. But what I see in people is a huge amount of disconnectedness one to the other. Um, there are cell phones, e emails, I don't even know the names of technology, I'm primitive. Emails, what, text messages, help me here, what else? What am I missing? Text messages, instant messaging, um, iPhones, iPods, um, I, Game Boys. I remember about two years ago I went to visit my grandson in Michigan over Christmas and he was glued to the Game Boy, Game Boy the whole weekend. I talked to my son, I said this can't be, and he took, he took it away when I came at least, so I had some time with my grandson. Uh, there has been also a huge explosion in obesity, in heart disease, in cancer, and what I will call neurotransmitter deficiency diseases, and I'll name some of them. Um, insomnia, obesity, ADD, we didn't even see ADD in 1970. ADD, ADHD, sleep apnea, sleep difficulties, chronic fatigue syndrome, panic, stress reactions, rage, anxiety, depression, OCD, fibromyalgia. There's been an explosion of all of this over the last 40 years, and there's been an explosion in prescription drugs. The prescri prescription drugs have their place, but they are replete with terrible side effects, and in addition to side effects, they're also replete with not really helping, in my opinion, a great deal, some of the neurotransmitter diseases. So let's talk a little bit about the cause of these effects. I talked earlier about cavemen and the fact that their flight or flight response occurred literally intermittently. 
Well, that's good news because the adrenals, which should be the size of large apricots, produce norepinephrine and, or and epinephrine. Those are the fight-flight hormones. If they're not produced every 30 seconds, there's going to be enough to deal with the fight-flight response. In the last 150 years, we've seen a number of things. Our soil has become depleted of nutrients. There has been a huge growth of what are called neurotoxic pesticides and chemicals which damage the nervous system. There's been an explosion in processed foods, fast food, trans fats, and sugars. And all of this, plus the stress that I talked about earlier, has led to an enormous decrease in neurotransmitters. So what are neurotransmitters? Neurotransmitters are the chemical messengers that let one part of a nerve cell in the brain and peripheral nervous system communicate with another part of the nerve cell. They exist at what we call the synaptic junction. The, the adrenals and the kidneys, unknown until recently, produce norepinephrine and epinephrine. Dopamine and serotonin are produced in the brain, the peripheral nervous system, and serotonin, interestingly, is produced in the gut. The fact that a lot of people walk around with gut pain has to do with depleted neurotransmitters in the gut, which they try to medicate either with drugs or with toxic foods or sugary foods. Um, a friend of mine in Texas with whom I work is an naturopath. We worked together for 25 years. His best description about our current adrenals is this. Our adrenal glands are like horses that have been ridden hard and put away wet. They're literally, at, the, at this moment, at the size of raisinets because there's just too much stress rattling around. Um, so, there had been a, an explosion of what I call neurotransmitter diseases, and these diseases in the, in the psychological realm have been dealt with with drugs. When I started practice, there were a different flavor of drugs. How many of you remember a drug called Elevil? Valium, okay, Stelazine. If you fast forward, there are different names and there's an explosion. When I started practice, I used as few as I could, but every time I used a drug, the wisdom then and now, from internists and psychiatrists was, that if a drug didn't work for a month, then you had to try a different drug and then it would work. No one knew then, and they still don't know now, that the reason that the drugs don't work is that at the neurosynaptic junction, initially they may increase the neurotransmitters and dam them up, but over time they deplete them up the yin-yang. And in that depletion come all the neurotransmitter diseases. I searched for 28 years to find an alternative. And about 12 years ago, found a physician who was brilliant in Minnesota, who put together a patented set of amino acids and cofactors, which we literally now use to help people with all the neurotransmitter diseases that drugs would supposedly help with, with great, great success. There are about 30,000 people in our pool, um, and we have very, very great success. I want to talk a little bit about what most of you know, and forgive me because I believe you do know it, about what all of us can do to deal with the stress of the current tsunami and what we can do to help ourselves with it. Number one, and I'm, I'm working on this, is stay away from the news. There's nothing in the news that's positive, there's everything that's negative, and you can't control it anyway. Number two, Take whatever you're upset about in a given day and report it to yourself for about five minutes. And then if there's a significant other or a loved one, report it to them for five minutes. And report it in, in some detail. And limit it to five minutes. For the rest of the time, use the energy that's connected to those upsets and that stress about whatever the economic trouble is. And Use it not to slosh around it or to dwell on it, but to do all that you can do with all the strength and determination of your will and talents to fix what you can't control. Let go of what you can't control and quickly move to other methods of dealing with it if one problem solving technique doesn't work. If it doesn't work, drop it and move on to something else. 
How many of you have seen the movie The Bucket List? That's it. Does someone want to talk about what The Bucket List is? Can you talk about it? Mr. Garrison. Um, <laughs> tell people what The Bucket List is, those that don't know. Um, it's a rich guy, Jack Nicholson, is that it? Okay. Yeah. Morgan Freeman. Yes, Morgan Freeman. And the rich guy talks him into, well, they both have supposedly cancer and they're going to die, but the rich guy wants to go out with a bang. He wants to do everything he can before he dies, and he talks this guy into going with him. Of course, the guy, Morgan Freeman's wife, is not real happy about it. Um, and, it, you know, it ends where... You know, Morgan Freeman dies, and then Jack Nicholson dies, and, and his ashes are buried up on a mountain or something, or put into the yeah. mountain. That's, that's the structure. The piece of it that got to me was, they created what's called a bucket list. And the bucket list is all the joyous things that you like to do before you die. Now, even if you're not going to die in a year, I think it's really important to create your own bucket list. Um, and I could read their bucket list, but uh, one of the things on it that's the most moving for me is help a c complete stranger for a common good. And what I would say about the bucket list is with your own means and within your constraints, implement it and live it as much as possible. And one of the important pieces of it, I didn't see it on the list that I garnered from the movie, is find, even if it's for two minutes, all the joy you can find in your life. A beautiful example of this came to me on 60 Minutes, about a week ago Sunday. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, is it Botticelli? Is that the singer? I had no idea, I mean he's a beautiful, he's got a beautiful voice, I had no idea that he embraced the bucket list. Whenever he was, his comment was, I'm, I'm compromised by my inability to see, but I'm going to spend my life doing all I can, everything I can, to truly enjoy myself. And so there he was skydiving, someone was helping him, there he was horseback riding, there he was water skiing, there he was with a beautiful family enjoying every minute. And with whatever is going on in this nightmare of a mess that we're in, that's something I would recommend very highly. Find some part of your day and put some joy into your day. Um, There are two other techniques for this. I don't know how many of you have read The Power of Positive Thinking by, by Norman Vincent Peale. They have, they have upgraded that into something called the secret. The skinny on it is that you Im imagine what it is that you want from the universe and focus on it and meditate on it and after a while it's going to come to you. And so one of the things that I suggest to my patients is that for five minutes a day with themselves or with a significant other, they meditate on, in quiet, in their minds, I or we attract whatever it is that you're looking to attract. Wealth, prosperity, opportunity, health, freedom from debt, in unlimited abundance from a universe that is truly abundant. And know that if it isn't happening at this minute, there was a, a story rendered in The Secret, which is a tape you can get, that people who wrote down what they wanted and put it away after a while, a year later, what they wanted became manifest. Now there's a hooker in this. The hooker is that if there are unconscious patterns and emotions rattling around in you or energies, they can obstruct what it is in your soul you want. So to the degree that you can do it, find a way to take them out of the picture. The, the next piece is that in terms of, I want to talk a little bit about something that's dear to my heart, which had a lot to do with a friend of mine in the back who helped me with early on. Number one, and at the end of this list, however you do it, well, the Bob will, I will agree with Bob that you work everything in your body. At some part of every day, find a way to exercise, because that's going to help you bust the stress gremlin. Why? If you do enough of it, if you work hard enough at it, it's going to minimize the stress and it's going to produce endorphins and it's going to help you a whole bunch. 
I, I exercise, I've run for about, since age 36, I'm 68, up until two years ago I was running six, day, six miles six days a week. For about a year and a half I swam a mile three days a week. It is an amazing stress buster. The last thing I want to talk about is what I do to help my patients. I talked about this a little bit already. I work when they come in with neurotransmitter diseases to help them deal with it without drugs and with the neurotransmitter support. And the other piece is, if you're chronically fatigued, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, it isn't always stress-related and psychological. Often, there can be problems with your metabolism that are not reflected in standard blood tests. Standard blood tests are based on a demographic of normal and abnormal people, and so the ranges are very wide. So patients have come in over 30 years and said, I feel like death warmed over, I go tell my doctor, and he said everything is fine. I've been blessed by working with a naturopath for 30 years, who he and I work together with normals that are more functional and narrow, and we pick up a lot of the other things that can cause some of the things that people struggle with. We pick up problems regulating glucose, anemias, hidden infections, and so on. The last piece of what I do, and I've developed this over 30 years, 39 years, is to find telescoped, easier ways to help people get rid of the blocks inside that keep them from being free, happy, and healthy, and that obstruct them in getting the things they want for themselves. So I thank you very much for the honor of talking to you today. I hope this was of a little bit of help to you. And I'll turn it back to uh, my dear friend Bob. Are we entertaining questions? I was going to suggest, may I have the mic again? I like this mic. That if there are any questions, I don't want to, I don't want to take time away from whoever else is talking. And so after people have talked, please feel free to come and ask your questions and I'll happily spend some time with you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, uh, Doctor. With that in mind, can I have everybody uh, please stand for a moment? Uh, the next gentleman that I'm going to introduce to you is uh, Mr. John Stelmecki, our clinic director and physical therapist at the law. And all the exercise methods uh, encoded in his brain. Mm -hmm. Today he's going to talk to you specifically about some of our philosophy and perhaps uh, give you an illustration on how it works uh, when you're considering the total body. Dr. Like Wolin just alluded to working everything every day. I think that's a good idea, but at least uh, working a full program for each joint to me is a, an even better program. So, uh, let's look at different ways of doing that. While he's coming up here to take over the mic and the talking part of this, would you all stand on your right leg and just balance yourself in the interim? <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold that. Hold that. Switch legs. Hold it. We're checking everybody. We've got cameras all over this place. Alright, now both feet up in the air. Okay, sit down. Thanks. <laughs> Gotta get the blood flow going. Thank you for coming today. Uh, I am John Stelicky, a uh, physical therapist here. Uh, I've been working with uh, Bob and Mary Lou for about six years now. So I appreciate you coming out. Um, the sun just came out, so we got a nice day here at Guided Health Plus 552. We've got our ocean backdrop here. Hope you appreciate this. This is get the taste of the ocean. And um, uh, my talk today is about uh, uh, Bob's work his line of work is a dangerous dozen, and what we want to do in place of that, which we call the essential six, six exercises that at a minimum that we should all be doing, as Dr. Bowen said, every day. You want to do something every day. So this is stuff that, as some patients here know, um, they, they do these types of things, so we'll, we'll get a little bit more in depth in a minute here. Um, on my background, I, like I said, I'm a physical therapist right now. Um, before I was a physical therapist, I was a, a personal trainer, just worked in the fitness field for a couple of years uh, with a background in exercise physiology, but I didn't know much about injuries, so um, we were taking people through their exercise programs uh, every day, 
And that seemed to be the missing link uh, for, for me in any way. So we kind of had an idea if you had an injury, what to do, a couple of things. But we pretty much said, well, just go stretch. Just go do some stretches. Let's stretch your hamstring. Um, that'll take care of it, hopefully. But we didn't really know what we were doing at the time. Uh, in this day and age, the personal trainers are a little bit more um, educated on some of those things. But So I went to physical therapy school and tried to figure out what to do with injuries. And that was my motivation to, to get into that field. But the um, getting back to the, the personal trainer, we didn't know about that, the effects of stretching. Now we, we it's starting to come out in the media, it's something Bob's professed for years. There are some pitfalls of stretching that could damage the nerves. Nerves, ligaments, cartilage, fascia, these are all the structures that you don't want to take through the stress of stretching. And we're going to talk about DROM, which is our alternative to stretching, and these other exercises in the essential sit. So here I am out here as a personal trainer. Bob's over here, kind of in a parallel universe, doing his great work and laying the groundwork for the last 30 years. I had no idea. And here we are together now. So uh, it's been great. Um, before I worked here, though, as a physical therapist, I was, I was over there. I uh, did some physical therapy in Cary. And it was pretty much your basic outpatient physical therapy. We did ultrasound, stretching, some exercises. We talked about posture a little bit, but not that much. It wasn't, it wasn't emphasized as it is here. Um, but so, as most physical therapy places, you're kind of in the ballpark. You're kind of in the ballpark, you kind of were on the right track, you thought. Um, as when I came to work with Bob, though, I figured out that, yeah, I'm in the ballpark, but I'm in the grandstands, I'm in the bleachers, I'm eating a hot dog, where Bob Guide is down there on the field doing the real work. So this is kind of where, this is where the truth lies with uh, the right way to exercise, the safe and sane way to train. So, um, <clears throat> coming here working, uh, it's been great, working with Bob and, and Mary Lou, and it's been kind of a revelation. And uh, it's really changed the way we practice in physical therapy. Hopefully, you can spread the word. Uh, so, what I want to touch upon, though, is why why do we get this way? When we talk about posture, and I think everybody who knows Bob when they first meet Bob, their posture instantly improves <laughs> because he has that effect on you. We go from this to this, and he gets everything in line and straight, and we feel healthier instantaneously. So it's magic. Bob works his magic. So um, this was the old me. And this was the new me, and we try to work on it every day. But gravity is always pushing us down. Gravity is a fact that we can't avoid. And that seems to be the big problem. Uh, when it comes to injuries, all sorts of problems with posture, that type of thing. So we always have to counteract that. So we have to constantly think about our posture. Um, let me talk about the uh, dangerous dozen. We're going to hand out the dangerous dozen. So I want to get a copy of this, and if you haven't seen it, it's something Bob developed a long time ago, and um, certain stretches, positions that you'd, you'd want to avoid, just to avoid those damages to the, the nerve, the fascia, the cartilage, the ligaments. These are things that keep us together, keep us working properly, and when damaged, they can lead to dysfunction, distress, and that's kind of what we deal with on a daily basis here in physical therapy. Um, an interesting story, though, when Bob originally came up with this, there was a, a young employee, a trainer of his, that thought this was the actual program and took a client through a uh, dangerous dozen and said, okay, here are 12 exercises for the day. Let's run through these. I know. I know. So, <laughs> something you don't want to get into here. So, they kind of speak for themselves when you see the dangerous dozen. The stresses to the back, the neck, and the knees are the biggest factors we see here. And um, <clears throat> certainly the joints weren't designed to go this far. Uh, they do have their limits, and we want to try to work within those limits. So, any questions on the, the dangerous dozen? Has anybody done these in the last week or so? Yeah, okay. There are some, there are, there are some activities that we recognize, some sports that do require you to get into these positions, so that's a fact of life as well. Um, gymnastics, uh, skating, karate, things like this. So we do recognize that, but we try to build up the joints as much as we can 
uh, so we don't have those injuries. So hopefully the strength will carry you through. And, um, so just to clarify, you're not supposed to no. do these. Dangerous means do not do. <laughs> do not do these. Right. There should be a big circle with a, a cross right. to do that. Thanks. So that's not what we do. Dangerous doesn't. The 12 most dangerous exercises. Uh, here are the essential six. These are going to be familiar to a lot of you. And I'll let you be asked those out. circular, a lot of muscles. Here's your, your big core, your mini core. So it's often neglected, but very important when it comes to posture and strength. So we start with this thing called uh, the chin lock, the chin lock position. And this gets kind of comp this gets uh, kind of complexicated. I just made a new word, complexicated. Uh, but it's kind of like Bob's. Bob has his own vocabulary too, so I think he's growing off on me. <laughs> Bob has other other terms that he likes to use. Like, uh, the intercom. Intercom. Anybody know what that is? The internet. Uh, John, go look that up on the intercom. You mean the internet? Okay. And the other day, last year, he had to go buy a moped for his daughter. It was a, you mean an iPod, Bob? Yeah. <laughs> And the other, when they were talking about the, the monkey, they said, why don't they hit him with the phaser? You mean a taser? <laughs> taser. Okay. So Bob, we love Bob. Uh, but the chin lock, basically, we want to uh, pull the chin in. Okay, so the chin comes in, you get the double chin, whatever you got. And you line up the top teeth with the bottom teeth. So from the chin lock position, we perform our exercises lying down. So it's like a sit-up for your neck. And we also do side-to-side -side and rotation. I'll, I'll show you here in a second, proper technique. And um, uh, I want to just show you right now. So you can do this laying down on the floor, or you can go over the edge of the bench, pull the chin in, top teeth lined up, eight count up, one, two, three, four, four, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have uh, side bending, likewise real slow, keeping the chin in. And then rotation, keeping the chin. And you perform those until you fatigue through the neck muscles. Those can also be done lying down on your side and also face down as well. But it strengthens all factors of the neck. Yes? It tightens the underneath the neck? Well, it'll strengthen all the neck muscles. So what we want to try to achieve is this V position in the neck. So if you're a smoker, it gets rid of the turkey wobble? I'm not a smoker, but my girlfriend is. <laughs> What, what about that? When you're a smoker, it gets rid of the turkey wobble wobble. It'll, it'll tighten it up, yeah. Okay. It'll tighten that up, yes. <laughs> Any questions on the, uh, the chin lock and the neck exercises? Okay. Go on to the next one. Oh, one more thing about the neck. I'm sorry. What if you get a cramp through it? What's the, first thing, what's the best thing to do? Rest. Stop. Yeah. You may be straining too much. If you're going slow, you should be okay. Um, okay. I've never had a case where somebody's neck cramped while doing these exercises. A few other exercises, if it does cramp, we do the opposite action, and that usually releases the cramp right away. So if you're cramping, let's say, on this side, we'd say, go to this side, and it releases that side through reciprocal inhibition. So, um, but we, we can't emphasize the neck enough. It's very important, just as important as your core muscles to train the neck muscles. Bob is always talking about 
good examples of the neck, we'll see it in the newspapers all the time. Bob will show me the newspaper. John, look at the newspaper here. I go, okay, the Cubs won. That's great. He says, no, no, no. Look at, look at, look at the guy right there. And he's showing me this picture of a pitcher. And I go, oh, it's the White Sox, Mark Burley. Okay, great. Oh, yeah, okay, I get it. He had a no-hitter. Great. No, John, no, no. Look at his neck. Look at that neck. He's got this neck. The veins are popping out. Look at that strong neck. So I thought it was the no-hitter. All right, on to the next. We got um, uh, reverse flies. So we're dropping down from the neck into the shoulder blade area. And when we talk about the shoulder blades, we like to get them down together, pinch them down together, versus everyday life puts us in a forward position, which is not very good when it comes to shoulder and neck health. So we want to get them down together and get the neck kind of in line. So with this, you can do them laying down as the figure shows on the floor or on a bench and just working the arms in a backward fashion, slowly. Uh, we can also use a band, let me show you this. So with a little bit of resistance, you can just pull down like this, shoulder blades are coming down together, and we're strengthening in between the shoulder blades. So that helps support our head and neck for everyday activities. Posture, posture. Isn't that an interesting word, posture? The word post, U-R-E, post, U -R -E. The post is straight up and down. Anybody, anybody ever thought of that? No. So think of posture like a post. Post on all bent over, nice and straight. Is that another one of Bob? I just thought of it, man. I just, <laughs> <laughs> all right, the next one is uh, reverse torso curls. This is a little advanced, looks a little strange, but it feels really good. Um, it's also a, a reset exercise for the lower back when it's tight, but more importantly, it strengthens the abdominals. So there's a lot of different ways to strengthen the abdominals. It's probably the most overworked, overused muscle group there is. This is very simple. You can see from the picture there, it's rotating the pelvis up and over towards the head. And you can also do it holding on. Let me show you this option. So you just roll up, pause, and down slow. Four count up, four count hold, four count down. Nice and slow, keep breathing, don't hold your breath. If it gets to be too hard, you can support the pelvis with the pillow, or we can angle, in this case, um, if you just start out, you can angle it down, make it a little easier. And even if that's a little too hard, we just start with regular torso curls as well, regular crunches. Okay. And we'll go on to the next one. A uh, hamstring reset. This is probably the first exercise. Anybody who comes to guide us will do this exercise to get the hamstrings to lengthen, relax, release. Um, it feels almost like a stretch. Sorry, sorry about that. But um, it's not. It's resetting. When I'm on active with the front muscle, the quads, I'm reciprocally inhibiting the hamstrings and getting them to lengthen. The key here is keeping the back straight and arched versus a slouch. If I do this, I don't feel it. So I sit tall. Raise the leg, hold for five to ten seconds. And then you would uh, do about five each side. And voila, you got your hamstrings covered. And you shouldn't have to do any more stretching on those guys. Okay, now we get into a little bit more uh, active activity here with the squatting. Um, the key here is body control. We have one leg of squats. And if you just start out, you might want to start with two-legged squats. Uh, very simply, you don't need any equipment. Again, the key here is controlled movement. So you have the foot out in front of you, coming down, slow counts down. As much as you feel comfortable, should be no knee pain. And then you go back up. You do a set of those, you switch legs. And it's a great, great simple workout. Everyone can do it. You don't need any equipment. If, if you're not ready for that, you just start, start out with the two-legged version coming down, but very, very slow. When you do them slow, the muscles are going to feel it because you're not using a load at this point. And the knees, you don't want to extra load up on the knees just yet. And you build up to the one-legged squats. Okay. And the last one here is the 
uh, SOAS reset. And if everyone goes to the last page, there's a picture of the SOAS configuration. And this is a trouble muscle. It gives everybody a lot of trouble because it can be tight, it can be short. When it's short and tight, it pulls on the five lumbar vertebrae, and that can contribute to back pain in and of itself. When we find the psoas is relaxed and released, not as much back pain. So we want to do things to get the psoas to lengthen and relax. So we do a lot of, uh, we try to do some psoas massage. It's a difficult muscle to get at. But you can do the psoas resets. Resetting is a way of getting the muscle to relax and lengthen. So basically laying down and extending the leg up past the body. Uh, I'll show you on this bench. Keep the abdominals tight and just take the leg up as far as it'll go, hold it a few seconds, and back down. You do it repeats, maybe 10 reps each side. If you can do this on a regular basis throughout the day, it's going to keep your hip flexors loose and it's going to help cut down on that low back pain. Along with uh, reverse torso curls, these are the two most important exercises if you're having some tightness in the muscles themselves. Okay, that's a separate of uh, joint pain, disc pain. So that's something that if you are in back pain, you work with you on these types of exercises. Um, okay, so as we said also, um, there's some options you can do with that. Not everybody has access to a bench. Uh, you can lay on the floor and do those. Even if, you're, uh, if you sit a lot, if you're driving or at work, try to get up once an hour and just maybe do some hip extension. Um, I don't know if I'm kind of getting into your area, but... Uh, Scott's going to talk a little bit more about work type exercises coming up. But the more we can do to get that psoas to, to lengthen and relax, it's going to be better off for us. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Alright, so there's a dangerous dozen. We got the essential six. Now we have the bonus, the second six. We're going to pass this out. These are six more exercises that everyone should do and involves a little bit of equipment. So that would be, mean maybe coming in here, working with the trainer, uh, the physical therapist, myself or Bob or Scott, and just setting up a, a little routine to take your program to the next level. Now um, you can find some modifications of the club that might work in the same muscle groups as well. So we're gonna run through these pretty quick. So we're getting into the lower legs with the shins and the calves. You have uh, the dart, which works the, the front of the shin, and then calf raises. Anybody can do this on the steps, so you just go up and down to work the calves. So that takes care of the lower legs, the dart, and the calf raises. And then moving on to the big four. It's an exercise you can do, um, like it shows here, we have a uh, man kind of bent over, keeping the back straight. Bring that arm back, rotate up, come forward and down. Of course, all the major muscles, the important muscles of the rotator cuff. Bob designed a piece of equipment to do this. And this is called the shoulder sizer. We use it here quite a bit. Same idea, retract, externally rotate, overhead, and come forward. That takes care of almost all the major muscles of the shoulder and the shoulder girdle. Moving on to side bends, using a core bench of some type. Uh, these exercise balls, you can do side bends as well. Going sideways for both the obliques, right and left. Adding a twist to that, ties in some of the front and the back muscles. The KP board is this one here. Everyone knows this if you've been here. Kinesthetic primer board, KP board for short. And everyone knows you can stand on it every which way, as the pictures show. It ties in the whole body all together. We have uh, d rod which is, we mentioned earlier, kind of our substitute for stretching, where it warms up the whole body, gets it ready for exercise and activity. You can kind of read through the description there. And this in and of itself is a workout for most people. We'll spend a good five minutes, as people are getting started, just working on body control, controlling your own body. So this is a program. When we have time later, I can kind of show you. We have some handouts on it as well. It gets a little bit more involved. I won't show you right now. And the oscillating beam, we have some up on the wall. Those long wooden beams designed for oscillation to be wobbly and unstable as you're walking across. Again, it ties in like the balance boards. It 
ties everything together, all the major muscle groups from the foot, ankle, knee, and hip, all the way up to the core. So, um, and just uh, to kind of wrap it all up, we have the honorable mention exercises. Uh, the Lex board, L-E-X, that's the other ankle exercise that we have available. So we have the Lex, uh, G2 Max, CMF, RCP, CRPs, CPR, CPD, Chris Cliff, CPD, Chicago Police Department, ICE, ICE, everyone gets ICE here, uh, all to avoid uh, colloids, coagulation, cistulated colloids, these are all Bob's terms, that I'm still trying to figure out what they mean. And, Typical things you get here for therapy, iontophoresis, Easton, G5, G5, what does the G5 stand for? G, guy to five, guy to five fingers. Uh, where else can you get the guy to five? Um, very unique, uh, has anybody seen the G5s anywhere else? For uh, treatment, maybe a chiropractor's office or something? The G5, it sounds like gene wise. Don't forget to check out the gene wise, we got that too. Um, but just to wrap it up, we got um, basically prevention is the key in our industry. With insurance companies the way they are now, um, the more you can do before you get hurt, the better. So that's, that's the name of the game. Uh, we'd like to see everyone stay fit, stay healthy before you get in here, but we can take care of you when you come in. So um, I think that's it. Thank you. That's why we love it. Uh, are y'all, everybody okay? Nobody's got to run out and get a potty break or anything like that? Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Scott Clark. Is, in, in addition to being a licensed chiropractor, uh, also very much into the physical aspects of exercize, uh, has so much to say on the subject. And we welcome to hear services here and I found you know, my observations of this exercise technique uh, and program quite remarkable. So without any further ado, Dr. Scott Clark. All right. Do I need this? Can you hear me okay? Because I'm going to actually have you guys exercising. How's that? <laughs> you know what? You've all been sitting for about 20 minutes again, so everybody stand up. We've heard from Dr. Wolin about exercising every day. John's followed us up, talked about exercising every day, given us some great exercises that we can do every day. I'm going to be here to reinforce everything those first two gentlemen have talked about and try to figure out a way that we can get it into our lives, even though we're all working probably, working long hours, thinking we don't have time for exercise. We're going to figure out how we can exercise at work, right at your desk, with no equipment, and still get some exercise in. Uh, a vast majority of the clients that I see in my chiropractic practice do not get injured from slipping on the ice. They do not get injured from... Uh, sports injuries or anything like that. The vast majority of people that I see in my practice are injured from repetitive strain, from poor posture, a lot of which occurs at work. Poor sitting at work. Go ahead and sit down. Um, the vast majority of pain that I see coming into the clinic due to postures of sitting computers all day long, driving all day long. Um, it's essential for us in order to treat this pain is to treat the underlying cause of the pain which is the posture of itself. When we hold our bodies in this position it puts significant amount of stress into the muscles. The muscles in our shoulders have to be under constant tension to keep our head from literally falling off our body. We develop chronic strain in there, trigger points, knots. How many of you have ever had someone come up behind you, press on your shoulder and you feel knots? That very much is due to postures coming forward. 
Um, the biggest problem I see with people sitting aside from posture is they sit too long. Okay? It only takes 15 minutes for the body to start to form, deform, the tissues in the body to start to deform. What does that mean in the spine? What that means in the spine is the vertebrae start coming together, the discs start compressing, the discs start bulging. If you've already got some arthritic change in your back, that can put compression on spinal nerves, cause pain in the back, cause pain in the leg. 15 minutes is all that takes. How many of us sit for longer than 15 minutes and don't even think about it? So what I'm going to recommend to you here today uh, is some postural advice, some things that I like to look for with good seated posture and what I encourage my patients to do in terms of good seated posture. I'm also going to encourage you to do some exercises and I also have a handout I'll be giving you 10 exercises that's going to work for the entire body, top to bottom. Uh, these are exercises again that will be done at the desk without equipment. Um, certainly the exercises John just gave you are appropriate for doing in the office too. Um, but depending on your situation and how embarrassed you might be to be doing some SOAS resets off the side of your desk, well, I'll give you an alternative for it. <laughs> um, so before we get going, the first and the most important thing I think, if you have the opportunity to stand up more often than you already are, fantastic. I say shoot for every 15 minutes because that's how long it takes the spine to compress. Is that realistic? I'm not sure. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it's a good place to start. Um, so stand up more often. Um, what do I look for in good posture? Um, sitting up nice and tall. We can't start in a slouch position. Um, so the first thing I talk about is you want to stand tall, that old string on the top of your head. What muscle do you think is primarily responsible for holding you up in that position? Anybody got any idea? Which core muscle specifically? Anybody think it's the back muscles that do it? Yeah, no, it's not really the back muscles that hold us up in nice, good seated posture. It's actually deep abdominal wall muscles, that transverse abdominus to be specific. Everybody know what that is? Transverse abdominus, oh my goodness. We've known for a long time that healthy abs tend to translate to a healthy back, right? And we've been doing a lot of crunches and sit-ups and oblique curls and all this and that. Now we say right track, wrong train. Still good exercises, but there's actually a muscle that runs deep to those muscles. It runs across the front of the stomach. It's called the transverse abdominus. The special thing about the transverse abdominus is it shares the same nerve supply as the deep stabilizing muscles of the back. Now here's the, here's the neat thing about it. While we can't consciously contract those deep muscles of the back, we can consciously contract transverse abdominus. And in doing so, not only are we getting support across the front of the body, we're also getting bracing in the back. And this is that core that everyone is is, is talking about. So what I'd like to do is just do a little experiment here just to show you how important that muscle is. A lot of us are sitting here today like this, aren't we? So the first thing I want you to do is to sit up tall in your chair, get out of that slouched position, nice and tall, okay? Um, and actually, come off the back of the seat rest just a little bit, just a little bit. Okay, and I want everyone to take their hands, put them on their belly, and I want you to pull your belly button in toward the spine. Okay, you feel how that sinks in? When you pull the belly button in and it sinks in towards the spine, you're contracting your transverse abdominus. As opposed to the other muscle, that six-pack muscle, the rectus, or the obliques, when you contract those, your stomach pops up. Okay, so we're looking for a tightening or pulling in. If you're sitting up nice and tall and you're pulling that muscle in, can anybody slouch? It's impossible to slouch. With that, right, or with that transverse activated. Here's the great thing about it. We don't have to walk around going as hard as we can all day long. They've measured how much of a contraction you need to get this core stabilization. Anybody got a guess of what percentage of a maximal contraction you need to get the effect of good posture? Five percent. Five percent. So if you walk away with only one thing today, 
Think about sitting up tall, pulling your belly button in, about 5% of a maximal contraction, and you're going to be well on your way to preventing injuries, especially posturally related injuries, while you're sitting. Okay? So that's my, that's my stump, if you will, for good posture, good seated posture. Okay? Now, I know it's unrealistic to think we're going to sit there like that all day long. We are eventually going to start to come back into this slouch posture. Okay? What are we going to do to correct that? I have another exercise. We call it Ruger's Relief Position. And we're all going to practice that right now because, again, this is one exercise that can be done at your desk. It only takes a couple of seconds and it resets all this poor posture for you. Uh, again, Bob's theory on a lot of things. Reset, reset, reset. Well, here's your postural reset. Brugger's relief position. And again, I've got instructions for you which you'll take home so you, so you remember. Everybody just scooch to the front edge of your chair. Okay? Again, you're going to be sitting up nice and tall. Your feet are separated slightly apart with the toes turned outward. Okay? Arms relaxed down by your sides. Okay, and remember John talked about that chin, getting that chin tucked in, let's get that chin tucked in. Very important, mini core. Okay, here's the exercise. What I'd like you to do is to take a nice deep breath in through the nose as you're breathing in, roll your thumbs backwards. Okay, what you should be feeling are the shoulders coming back and down and the chest opening up and exhale through the mouth and let the hands come back into just relaxed by your side position. Can everyone feel how that opens you up? You went from collapsed in, gravity pulling you down toward your desk, to nice and big and tall. Okay? Um, three, five, ten breaths done every couple hours like this is a nice reset for you. And that's going to that's gonna help prevent a lot of the upper back and neck soreness that a lot of us experience with uh, with prolonged sitting, particularly prolonged sitting with poor posture. Um, and again, that's, if there's one exercise that you take away from this today, that's one that's going to help you out quite a bit. Now, uh, let me hand out my handouts here. I've got ten other exercises that can be done at the, can be done at the desk. Uh, this kind of work with the whole body. And uh, Again, while we encourage all of you to work out on a daily basis and to do a lot of the exercises that John just gave us. Uh, sometimes time is a factor. Um, these exercises aren't meant to replace uh, those types of exercises or going to the gym or working out, but it will get you a little bit of workout at your desk. Uh, so we'll, we're going to go through all of these today. So I get the, I get the practical lecture today. Okay. Um, Everybody realizes we've got muscles around the eyes, right? And we all are subject to eye strain working at the computer. So the first exercise I've got on here is an eye exercise. Okay? And again, when you're doing these exercises, let's all sit up with good posture. Everybody slouched again. <laughs> let's all sit up. What do we engage? We engage that transverse abdominis muscle. Pull it in slightly, about 5%. First eye exercise. I want you to look in just clockwise with your eyes. Open up the eyes, big and wide, and go clockwise. You go about ten times clockwise. Okay? We won't do all ten. Let's go counterclockwise. Giving the eyes a break. Okay? How many people have trouble doing that? <laughs> okay. Wrist exercises. We're keyboarding, we're mousing, we're texting. We've seen a lot of wrist injuries now. We can do some exercises for our wrist. Everybody stands the hands out in front of you. Okay? We're going to drop the hands down, bring the hands up. Drop the hands down, bring the hands up. You know what? I'm not huge on counting. If you want a number, ten. Okay? Do it till you feels good. I mean, if you do five and you're feeling all right, you're done. If you still feel a little tight, do ten. Okay? And then we're going to turn the hands up and over. Very simple. Okay. Hand and finger exercises. A little bit more specific to the hands and fingers. 
Okay? Hold your hands out, squeeze your fists. Okay? Hold it for about two seconds. And now since we're not at a desk, separate your fingers big and wide and just press them down on your thighs. Okay? And then relax it. Bring the hands out in front again, make a tight fist, squeeze, a couple seconds, open up big and wide and just press them down. Okay, good. That can be repeated again five times or so and we've got our hands loosened up. Okay, got a couple exercises for the shoulders. Okay, um, the old shoulder rolls, everybody's getting a tight shoulder sitting, so we're just going to make some big circles forward, big circles back. Forward and back. Okay. Everybody still sitting up nice and tall? I think so. Good. Shoulder exercise too. Let's bring both hands up above the body. And I want you to pretend you're like climbing a ladder. Just reach up with the right and left. <laughs> Good. Working our way down, upper back and shoulders. Oops, you know what? I skipped one, didn't I? Sorry about that, guys. We skipped the shoulder shrugs. Okay, exercise number five. Bringing the shoulders up and then relaxing them down. And down. Okay? Not too tough. Okay. Number seven. I didn't asterisk this one probably should have, because there's a couple different things I'd like to do for the lower back. Again, my, my preference with low back for sitting uh, is that you actually stand up and do some back extensions. Okay? If that's not realistic, another option would be a forward bending stretch uh, while seated. Okay? So you want to separate the legs a little bit wider than shoulder width apart. Think about your body as being like a slinky toy. You're going to drop your chin to your chest, let your shoulders roll forward, and just slump down towards the floor. Now I caution you here, the idea isn't to force yourself all the way down to the floor. We don't want to stretch things out too much. Just a gentle curl down and curl your spine up, one vertebrae at a time. Okay, just like a little slinky toy. Okay, good. Working our way even further down into the legs, the hamstrings. Here's a great opportunity to do one of John's exercises. Okay, one of the, one of the big six. The, the hamstring resets can be done sitting at your chair. Okay, an alternative to that just to get a little range of motion into, into the legs would be to grab one knee, pull it up toward the body. Back down and switch sides. Okay. So you got a couple different options there. You can do the hamstring resets. Great exercise. Probably preferable to the one that's listed down here. Um, or, or do the knee to chest. Okay. All right. John talked about little core, the neck. Major, major things that we got to work on with seated posture. Okay, so we've got a few neck exercises, uh, and again, this goes right along with what we've talked about already. We want to work neck rotation. We want to turn to one side, hold for a couple seconds, turn to the other side, and hold. And again, you can repeat side to side as many as you, as you need to start feeling loosened up. You can drop the chin to the chest and back, drop the chin to the chest, and back again up to five times, and then most importantly is the chin lock that John talked about. <coughs> Pulling that chin straight in towards the spine, a lot of people think that makes you look like you're trying to get a double chin. I worked with a therapist once from New Zealand who thought that looked like a chicken, I don't know, it looks to me more like a pigeon. <laughs> Very important exercise. Okay. And lastly, what I have down here is exer neck exercise number two. We'll be dropping the ear down toward the shoulder. Okay. 
we were talking about all those exercises and still got through them all in probably less than 10 minutes. Um, when you're trying to do these at work, you'll probably get through them even quicker, five minutes. Um, ideally, I'd like to see you do a couple of these exercises every hour, okay? Uh, maybe even more often. Uh, Brugger's, the first, one, the first one that we did, definitely you want to be doing throughout the day. And these other ones at least, at least every couple hours, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. So I think uh, with starting off with Dr. Wolin and his encouraging us to exercise on a daily basis, John following up and giving us some exercises that uh, Bob has developed over the years uh, that he feels are significant for keeping our bodies in great shape. And now some opportunity to exercise while we're at work, right at our desk without any equipment. I think you're armed with some pretty good information as you leave here today. Now it's going to be up to you to go out and, and utilize it and put it to work. And as much as we like to see you all in here as patients, we really don't want you to get hurt. Try to do this stuff and uh, come and see us on occasions like this and not for therapy. Um, I have the honor of introducing our next speaker. She is the founder and president of the Guida Health Plus Network, Guida Empire, uh, and Mary, Mary Lou Guida will be coming up and uh, I think you're doing a raffle for us, is that right? Actually, we sort of changed things around. Oh, I wasn't informed? No, we weren't I'm sorry. And actually, okay. Dave Garrison, Matthew Dave Garrison, is going to come up and finalize this section with some breathing exercises. Dave. Just wanted to give you guys uh, one last exercise for the day. And in martial arts, one of the things that we train in is, uh, you know, lung enhancement. Okay, our lungs are one of the most important organs in our bodies. Very important that uh, we, we think about breathing. In, the, in this culture that we're in here, um, I don't think we're taught how to breathe. In the Orient, you're taught how to breathe. It's like part of education to, to know how to breathe. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, breathing exercise. You can almost double your lung capacity. Uh, it's a proven fact that you can double the lung capacity if you work at it. So what you're going to do is you're going to breathe in your nose, you're going to breathe out your mouth, and you're going to take your tongue and put it on the roof of your mouth so you restrict the breathing. So everybody stand up. We can do it sitting, but it's better for standing. Okay. What we're going to do is we're just going to take our feet and just turn your toes in a little bit. It kind of looks silly doing it, and just let your knees get soft and bend. Okay. And posture is perfectly straight. If your chin's tilted forward 15 degrees, what that will do is restrict your airflow by 25%. So the chin has to stay very high, really important, okay? So like the string, like Doc was talking about, okay? So what we're going to do is just hands down low, breathe into the nose. Back out. Way too fast. You want to try to do almost 60 seconds. That's going to be almost impossible today, but we're going to try to get out, let's say like 20 seconds, okay? Ready, go. Knees got to bend. There you go. Back straight. Chin up. Okay. Again, up. Down. Now let's try to get a little longer. Long, more breath in, more breath out. In. Push your knees to back together. Back straight. Okay. One more. In. And breathe. So again, there's about eight or nine different exercises you can go through. One of them is called the archer. It works out of a position like this. You can do ones that are like breathing positions that are down low. And you're breathing in a position like this. There's all kinds of positions where you work. And basically what you're trying to do is enhance the lungs and open them. If you noticed, we're inhaling with raising the hands and we're exhaling with closing. So what I tell the kids a lot of times, think of your lungs like an accordion. Okay, so you open the accordion and you squish it back down. And you open the accordion and squish it back down. And so it's just as important as how much you breathe in as how much you exhale. So at the end of exhalation, you actually want to
and you're tightening those stomach muscles, those abs, squeezing everything you can get out of the lungs. So again, it's just a great way to finish up. All right, good job, you guys.